Okay, right. Uncertainties. This one is where all your calculation part will come about. All right. Now, all readings taken from a measuring instrument are always subject to uncertainties. Okay. Uncertainty comes about when your reading does not fall exactly on the scale reading of your instrument. What do I mean by that is, take for example, maybe this one is 5.5, 5. this one is 5.6 on your ruler, this one is 5.7. You are trying to measure the length of an object. And it so happens that the edge of one of the object is somewhere around here, okay? Now, when you try to take your measurements of your length for the object, you will say that, or oh, because the edge of the object is roughly aligned at 5.6 here, you would say that the length is maybe 5.6 centimeter. But you see, the thing is that, how sure are you that the edge of your object is falling exactly at the 5.6 mark. It could be slightly a bit more, or it could be slightly a bit less. That's where the uncertainty arises. Because a lot of cases, the thing that you're measuring, like for example, length here, the edge of the object itself may not perfectly align with the scale reading. It could be slightly a bit more, it could be slightly a bit less. That's where your uncertainty arises. So in order to take into account this, that's where the concept of uncertainty comes about. You will normally express your measurements with its uncertainty. It tells you the range of values within which a measurement is likely to lie. You normally quote the absolute uncertainty, which is the maximum range in which a reading is likely to lie. So back to this example here, I mentioned that the edge of your object may not exactly fall at 5.6, it could be slightly more, it could be slightly less, but what you are very sure is that it definitely would not exceed half the smallest division. Okay, it will not exceed half the smallest division above and below 5.6. Your smallest division right now is this one. Between 5.5 and 5.6, this is your smallest division between a scale reading. This is 0 0.1 centimeter. So when you want to express a uncertainty with your measured value, you express it with the absolute uncertainty. It tells you the maximum range in which your reading is likely to lie. So your edge of your object here definitely will not be more than half the smallest division above and below 5.6. So this one here, is your absolute uncertainty. We normally estimate absolute uncertainty to be half the smallest division on your measuring scale, okay? So in our case here, half your smallest division is half of 0 0.1, giving us 0 0.05 centimeter. So this measurement that we have here, we will express it as 5.6 plus minus 0 0.05 centimeter. It tells us that the range of your values is going to be around here. Not more than that, not less than that. Okay, that is what absolute uncertainty is. Now, when you're talking about writing your values with this absolute uncertainty, we tend to write it in this form, x plus minus delta x. Now, the delta x that you see here, when you first see it, you may have thought this is change in x like what you would have learned in maths. That is not the case here, okay? The delta x here refers to the absolute uncertainty in x, okay? The delta, the triangle symbol here, refers to absolute uncertainty in x, not change in x, okay? Now, absolute uncertainty, has a few, uh, when you're talking about uncertainties, there are a few rules that you need to commit to memory. Absolute uncertainty is always expressed to one SF only, okay? And the measured value must always have the same DP as the absolute uncertainty. 
these are the two rules that you need to remember when expressing your measure value with its uncertainty. You need to follow rule number one before moving to rule number two. So in essence, it means this. You, when you express your measure value with its uncertainty, make sure that the absolute uncertainty is one SF only. Then make sure that your measure value follows the same DP as your absolute uncertainty. Okay. Now, absolute uncertainty is just one form of uncertainty that you will learn. There's another two different uncertainties. One is fractional uncertainty, another is percentage uncertainty. Fractional uncertainty is just you taking the absolute uncertainty divided by your measured value. Percentage uncertainty is your fractional uncertainty changed to percentage form only, where you multiply by 100%. Okay. Now, absolute uncertainty will always be at 1 SF, but fractional uncertainty and percentage uncertainty, you can have more than that, maximum 2 SF, okay? So when you do your questions, sometimes you need to be able to identify how to find out the absolute, the fractional or percentage uncertainty from the given values. So the example would be something like this. Let me just close some of the stuff. I'll clear off everything. Okay, find the absolute fractional and percentage uncertainty for these measured values. Okay. So right now, L is 2.05 plus minus 0 0.05 centimeter. This one you can clearly identify it as your absolute uncertainty. So right now, the absolute uncertainty delta L is 0 0.05. Your fractional uncertainty is delta L over L, 0 0.05, divided by 2.05, giving you 0 0.024. Then your percentage uncertainty is just simply fractional uncertainty multiplied by 100% to change it to percentage form. This one will be 0 0.024 times 100, giving you 2.4%. Okay, so this is how you identify your absolute fractional and percentage. Now, if you move on to the second example, I equals to 3.04 plus minus 2% ampere. This is for measurements of current. You notice that this one is slightly different. There's a percentage form attached to the uncertainty. When you see a percentage symbol attached to your uncertainty, this one will not be absolute uncertainty. This one is talking about percentage uncertainty. Okay. Whenever you see your measure value plus minus something with percentage there, that is not absolute uncertainty. That is your percentage uncertainty. Okay. So right now your percentage uncertainty is 2%. You can just say that delta I over I times 100% here is 2%, okay? Then when you want to find the fractional uncertainty of your i, is delta i over i, you're just bringing this over to this side. 2 divided by 100, giving you 0 0.02. That's all there is to it. And then after that, when you want to find your absolute uncertainty delta i, you just make use of these expressions that you have. Because you know fractional uncertainty is 0 0.02 and fractional uncertainty is delta i over i, you can likewise just rewrite this as delta i over 3.04 equals to 0 0.02, giving you delta i equals to 6.08. Remember that absolute uncertainty must be a 1SF, so this one is just 6. So this is how you will identify all the different uncertainties from your given values, right? So this is one part. Then after that, you look at the next example, express the measurements with this uncertainty to the appropriate number of SF. Make sure that all this is following the rules that were described here. 
Okay, these are the two rules. Now, if you look carefully at the way that your measurements are described here, this is one D, sorry. This is one SF, one DP. Well, maybe I need to, sorry, I just need to uh, make the thing larger. Okay. Right, uh, before I go to that, let me just write out the rules for you. The first thing was that absolute uncertainty must be one SF only. And then the second rule was that measured value dp follows dp of absolute uncertainty okay these two rules are the ones that you need to remember okay absolute uncertainty must be one as a measure value dp follows dp of absolute uncertainty so now if you look at this one here your absolute uncertainty is in 1SF, 1DP, okay? If you relate this to your first rule, no issues here. You are having it at 1DP, that one is okay. But then when you try to relate it to your second rule, you see your measure value here has no DP. The second rule states that your measure value dp must follow the dp of your so uncertainty. So right now, if you already have one dp here for the absolute uncertainty, your measure value must have one dp too. So it must be written as 10.0, okay, giving you one dp. So this is you following both rules already. Now, if you move on to the second example for mass, 2.5742 plus minus 0 0.0024, you look at the absolute uncertainty. The absolute uncertainty is in 2SF for DP, okay? Now, looking at the SF of your absolute uncertainty itself, you already see it's not following the first rule. It must be in one SF only. So you need to rewrite this as plus minus 0 0.002. So now it actually becomes one SF, three DP. Now, when you look at your second rule then, measure value DP must follow DP or absolute uncertainty. This one is four DP your dp of your measure value must match the dp of your absolute uncertainty after having followed the first rule. So this one is at 3 dp after having followed the first rule. Your measure value must be at 3 dp too. So this one needs to be rewritten as 2.574, giving you 3 dp here. Okay, so by writing it in this form, you would have followed both rules again. Now, the last two examples will be a bit different because you don't have decimal places to work with. Okay, when you don't have decimal places to work with, the way you will express your uncertainties is a bit different. Okay, right now, volume equals to 4783 plus minus 25 centimeter cube. If you look at the absolute uncertainty, this one is 2SF no dp. Now, first rule states that absolute uncertainty must be 1SF only. So this one, you need to round it up to 1SF. It actually becomes plus minus 30. So now this one is 1SF, no dp. Now in the process of rounding it up to 1SF, you will notice that you have actually round to nearest 10. Okay. So when you want to move on to the second rule, you see this one here, it again has no DP. How are you going to use the second rule here when there's no DP to work with? This one requires DP to work. So in cases like this, where there's no DP to work with, 
what we will tell you is that rather than matching the DP, you need to match the rounding of your measured value with the rounding of your absolute uncertainty. What do I mean by that is this. You see, when I rounded up my absolute uncertainty to 1SF, I actually rounded it up to the nearest 10. So your measured value here must also be rounded to the nearest 10, giving you 4780. This one round to the nearest 10. This one will be the correct way to express it. Now, if you look at the last example, where we tell you error is 3891 plus minus 340 millimeters squared, you look at this one again. This one is, let's just say it's 2SF. Uh. You can assume it's 3SF also, it doesn't matter. But I assume it's 2SF. 2SF, no DP. Same thing as before, this one must be 1SF according to the first rule. So this one must be plus minus 300, giving us 1SF, no DP. But in the process of rounding it up to, the, to 1SF, we round to nearest 100. So now if I want to apply the second rule, again, because I have no DP here for my measured value, what I'll do is that I'll match the rounding with the absolute uncertainty. Since my absolute uncertainty was rounded to the nearest 100, my measured value must be rounded to the nearest 100 too, giving me 3,900. So this one is rounded to the nearest 100, okay? This is the way to do it if you do not have any decimal places to work with, okay? But there's another way to work around this. Wait, if you're talking about these two examples here where there are no deep symbol places to work with. So if you want to express it with this uncertainty, there's a way to work around it. That is by re-expressing the values such that they have DP decimal places instead. Now, what do I mean by that is something like this. If you look at volume, it was 4,783 plus minus 25, isn't it? Now I can re-express this in another form such that it has decimal places. I can express it as 47.83 plus minus 0 0.25 times 10 power two. They're still the same value, just that this one in this form now, it already has decimal places. You see now this one is, 2SF, 2DP, okay? So say right now you want to apply the first rule here. This one must be changed to 1SF giving me plus minus 0 0.3. This one would now be at 1SF, 1DP. For the second rule applied to the measure value, I need to change this to 1DP, I need to change it to 1DP. So this one will become 47.8 times 10 power two. Okay, so this one is 1 dp already, matching the absolute uncertainty. So now if you go and multiply back the times power, the 10 times 2 in, you're going to get back this, 4,780 plus minus 30. Right? You see, isn't this answer here the same as this one here? It's actually the same thing. Okay, if you want to repeat that ex example for the last one, it's the same too. You can see that 3891, I think, is it one? Yeah, 3891. 3891 plus minus 340. I purposely put, re expressed it such that they have decimal places. So maybe this one could be 3.8. 91 plus minus 0 0.340 times 10 power 3. Again, they're the same value, just that this time it has decimal places. So you see now this one has 3SF, 3DP. So following first rule, this one must be re-expressed in 1SF giving me plus minus 0 
now I would have one SF, one DP. So my measure value, if I want to follow the second rule, I need to write it in one DP on it. This one will then become 3.8. Okay, so it's 3.8 plus minus 0 0.3 times 10 power 3. In the end, you get 3,800 plus minus 300. So you see, this is the same thing as before. Okay, so it's really up to you when you see the values of epsilon uncertainty doesn't have decimal places. You can either use this method or you can either use this. But frankly speaking, this is actually the most straightforward one. You just need to see whether you're rounding to the nearest land, 100 or 1000. This one will actually be faster. Okay. But for some people, they prefer this because it seems more logical to them. But it's really up to you. They're, they're both the same thing. Okay. So this is how you express your uncertainties in general. Okay. So that's okay. Then let me just move on to the next one calculating uncertainties. Okay. So I'll clear this one off. If you need time to copy, you can copy it from the lesson recording later, which I will upload. Okay, so let's clear this one off. Okay, now, what you have learned here is just how to express your uncertainties. And why are there uncertainties in the first place? Now, on the second part here, we'll talk to you about how do you actually calculate out uncertainties, all right? Now, a lot of times when you try to measure something or try to find the value of a certain quantity, it is often obtained by you measuring a few other related quantities, such as when you're trying to find the volume of a cylinder or the expression or the extension of a spring under a load. What do I mean by that is, you see, if you have a cylinder, maybe I use a separate color. So let me just, what do I mean is something like this. You see, if you have a cylinder like this, you want to find the volume of your cylinder. You will first need to find out your area A, which is pi over 4d square, and then you need to measure your length L. So your volume here is actually pi over 4d square times L. All right. Now you your measurements, when you try to find the volume of your cylinder, you actually need to measure two different things, the length as well as the diameter. Now the length itself will have an uncertainty in the length. The diameter will also have an uncertainty in its diameter. So these two measurements itself will actually have their own uncertainty. Okay, and you need to measure these two quantities before you can actually find out the length. Okay, then after that, if I talk to you about your extension of a spring under load, it could be something like this. Once you put your load, your spring extends all the way up to here. If you have a ruler here, like this, you're interested in finding out the extension E. So how you find your extension E, is that you measure what is your length L1 here, you measure what is your length L2 here, isn't it? Then after that, your E is actually L2 minus L1. Now this length L, when you measure, has an uncertainty delta L. This length L2 also has an uncertainty delta L. Maybe delta L1, delta L2 here. So you see here, when you want to measure something as simple as ex extension also, you actually have to find out what is this length and what is this length. And both of them also have their own uncertainties. Okay, so the final quantity that you have, let's say the volume here and the extension here, will have to take into account the uncertainties of the other measurements that you have initially made in the first place. Okay, now the new uncertainty, the uncertainty of that final quantity that you calculate 
it's called the consequential uncertainty. All right. And it's normally obtained by adding together your absolute, your fractional, or your percentage uncertainties. Now, your uncertainties can never be subtracted. It will always increase and never decrease when more quantities are measured, which would make sense. If each measurement that you make has an uncertainty to it or an error in it, the more measurements you make, obviously, the more uncertainty, the more errors there is. Just because you make more measurements doesn't mean that your errors is going to drop or your uncertainty is going to drop. It's only going to compound. It's only going to add up. So that's why we say here, when you want to find your overall uncertainty of that final quantity that you see here and here, you need to add them up. You will never subtract. Never ever subtract. Because if you subtract, it means your uncertainties are decreasing, which doesn't make sense. Okay, so... When you want to find the final uncertainty of that final quantity that you measured, that you calculate as a result of you measuring other things in the first place, there are a few forms that you need to remember. If that final quantity is just simple addition or subtraction, like we say y is equals to a plus b or y equals to a minus b, we will say that the uncertainty of y is just the uncertainty of a plus b the uncertainty of b. Okay, this is the first form that you need to know. If it's in this form, y equals to a plus b or y equals to a minus b, is delta y equals to delta a plus b delta b. So say for example, now you have a measurement. A is 41.2 plus minus 0 0.1. B is 20.5 plus minus 0 0.5. And we tell you y is equals to a plus b. So you take y as a plus b itself giving you 61.7. Then your uncertainty of y is delta a plus delta b. You take 0 0.1 plus 0 0.5 giving you 0 0.6. So your uncertainty is expressed like this with its measure value 61.7 plus minus 0 0.6. You add the uncertainties here. This one here is you adding the absolute uncertainties together. Okay. Conversely, if it's y equals to a minus b, it's also just going to be same. Just take a minus b, but your uncertainty, absolute uncertainty is just still added up together. It's still going to be at 0 0.6, just like the original variant of it. Okay. Now, what if your form of the equation or the form of the final quantity that you want to find is in this form? Is the product or quotient of each other? Say y is equals to a times b or y is equals to a divided by b. Now, in your case here, what you will do is this. You will actually add up the fractional or percentage uncertainties together. If it's y a over if it's y equals to a times b or y equals to a divided by b, it's just going to be delta y over y or delta a delta y over y equals to delta a over a plus delta b over b. This is you adding the fractional uncertainties. Okay, but in some cases you can also change them all in percentage form. Okay, if you change them all into percentage form, multiply by 100%, it will become this form. Okay, this one is you adding the percentage uncertainties. Okay, all right, either of this form is fine. But it's only applicable if you have your final quantity expressed in this manner. Okay. So that one is okay. Right. Okay. So now if you have an example y is equals to a times b, and given that a is 10 power at 10.3 plus minus 0 0.1, and b is 5.6 plus minus 0 0.1, you first pass, you just first find out what is y. Let me just clear off everything. 
you just first find out what is y. Y is just a times b giving you this. And then after that, because this one is in this form, y equals to a times b, you need to use this form of the equation put here. Delta y over y is delta a over a plus delta b over b. Delta a is 0 0.1 divided by 10.3. Delta b is 0 0.1 then divided by 5.6. Then you get this. So this one is telling you delta y over y is 0 0.03. Now this one is in fractional form. Okay. When you express your values with its uncertainty in this is usually in the absolute uncertainty form so you want to find it in delta y form you want to find it in delta y form it is delta y equals to 0 0.03 times with 57.68 because the original form was this delta y wait let me just write it properly because this one will be Delta y 57.68 equals to 0 0.03. So giving you delta y 0 0.03 57.68. So you get this answer here. Okay, so this is your y equals to 58 plus minus 2 centimeter squared. Okay, so you get this answer here. So this is your y equals to 58 plus minus 2 centimeter squared. All right, this is your absolute uncertainty. All right. So this part is fine. Okay, then after that, when you have another different form, say your form is raised to a power or something. Okay, when you have a variable that is raised to a power of n, you need to bring down that power. What I mean by that is, say if y is equals to a power m b power n you will be delta y over y m times delta a over a plus with n delta b over b okay why do we say you know, this why do we multiply by the power having brought down is because if you take this example y is equals to a power 3 b power 2 y equals to a power 3 b power 2 can be re-expressed as this isn't it y is equals to a times a times a times b times b right then after that this one if you recall that y is equals to a times b will be delta y over y delta a over a plus delta b over b you're applying that form of the equation for this one just that there are more terms here you in the end get this one Okay, delta y over y equals to delta a over a three times plus delta b over b two times. So in the end, it simplifies to this. So this one here is actually the same effect as you uh, lowering the power down. It's the same effect as you bringing the power down. Okay, so that's the reason why we say it like this. Just bring down the power. Whenever you see that it's raised to a certain power, just bring down the power and multiply it with the fractional uncertainties. Okay. Now, in some cases, you may see in this form, say, for example, rather than y equals to a power 3, b power 2, it might be y equals to a power 3 divided by b power 2, giving you a power 3, b power negative 2, right? Now, in cases like this, just ignore any negative sign in the raised power. Because uncertainties, as I mentioned, will never subtract. It will only add up. With more measurements, uncertainties only increase. It will never decrease. So you can never subtract. So like in your case here, you will see that there's a negative 2 here. Just ignore the negative 2. Just bring down the 2 only. So this one will become delta y over y equals to 3 delta a over a plus 2 delta b over b. Then you get this. And if let's just say you have y equals to 1 over a, and then this one is a power negative 1, it will just become like this. This is the same as you bringing the power 1 down, giving you this. The same as something like this. Now y over y, 1 times delta a over a, 
giving you this instead. Okay, so this is the form of the equation that you need to be aware of. Now for the special case, this one, this one, I'll just leave it first until I go through the example. Uh, if you just move on to the next page, okay, these first three examples are the most common one that you will see in your exam questions. Addition and subtraction, product or quotient, and raising to a power. Most of your calculations for uncertainty will revolve around these three forms. The fourth one is a special case. It doesn't come out that frequently, but I won't explain that one now. I will explain it when I go through the example. Uh, if you look at page seven of your notes, the next page, there are some examples here that you can do. We'll just go through the example. Okay. All right? Yes. Okay, now you have an object that measures the following you have an object measure that gives you the following reading r1 equals to this r4 equals to this what's the length l of the object this one you can say that l is r4 minus r1 you can see that this one is in this form y is equals to a minus b so you can say that delta L is actually delta R4 plus delta R1. So over here, this one is just simply 23.00 minus with 20.55 giving you 2.45. Whereas your delta L will actually just be the uncertainties added together giving you 0 0.1 okay so therefore l is equals to 2.5 plus minus 0 0.1 centimeter right this one must be in 1sf Right, so when this one is in 1SF, this one is in 1DP. So your measure value must be at 1DP also, following the same rule as just now I mentioned. Okay, so this is one part. So this one here, you can see that it's 2DP, right? Uh, yeah. This one you can see is 2dp, but I won't express it following 2dp. I need to follow the dp of my absolute uncertainty. Right, so that's one part. Okay, now if you look at question two, maybe I'll go, I'll just scroll it out here. Okay, in an experiment, the external diameter d1 and the external diameter d2, our metal tube is found to be 64 plus minus 2 millimeter and 47 plus minus 1 millimeter. What is the percentage uncertainty D1 minus D2? Okay, so for cases like this, okay, for cases like this, let me just get rid of this thing here. Okay, what is the percentage uncertainty in D1 minus D2? Right, this one would help if you just say something like this. Uh, let y equals to d1 minus d2. Okay. Right, so basically the quantity that you have here is actually d1 minus d2. You assign a variable to it, it will make your life a lot easier. So let y d1 d2. So delta y over y will be delta d1 over d1 plus delta d2 over d2. Okay. So y is 64 minus 47 giving you 17 then delta y oh hey, sorry um it's not in this one my mistake, sorry. Because this one is y equals to a minus b. This one will be delta y equals to delta d1 plus with delta d2. Okay. 
So this one I can say this y is 64 minus 47 giving me 17 and delta y is just going to be 2 plus 1 giving me 3. So this one therefore y is equals to 17 plus minus 3 millimeter. Okay, so this one is 1SF already, no DP. And this one is ready to the nearest one. Okay, so this one, your absolute, your measure value, you can just leave it as it is, no? This one has no DP, right? So since your absolute uncertainty is really rounded to the nearest one, just make sure that your measure value is also rounded to the nearest one. Then you're good to go already. Alright, so that one is this one. Okay, so the question doesn't want it in absolute uncertainty form. The question wants it in percentage uncertainty. So what you do is that you need to do one step further. You need to say that percentage uncertainty in Y this is one way of writing percentage uncertainty. I've seen some people write that as this. this one represents percentage uncertainty in Y. It's percentage symbol, then the absolute uncertainty symbol. Okay, I've seen some people write this to represent percentage uncertainty in Y. It's also applicable. So this one is delta Y over Y times 100%. It should be 3 over 17 times 100. giving you 18%, right? This is you finding percentage uncertainty, okay? All right, then after that, if you move on to three, the formula for the period of a single pendulum is T equals to two pi square root L over G. Such a pendulum is used to determine G. The fractional uncertainty in the measurement of period T is X, and that in length L is Y. What's the fractional uncertainty in the calculation of G? Okay, now T is equals to 2 pi square root L over G. They want it for G. What you will need to do is you make G the subject, like how you would want to find the units last time in chapter 1. So this one becomes T square, 4 pi square L over G. So G in turn becomes 4 pi square L over T squared, right? This is one part. Then after that, if you want to find out the expression for the fractional uncertainty of G, you see this form here is kind of like Y equals to A power M, B power N. You see your variables are raised to a certain power. So this one, you will write it in this form. Delta G over G, Delta L over L. There's no power to multiply with because this is just power one. But the bottom one, you need to multiply by power two. So this one is Delta T over T. Okay, now in the process of doing this, you may have noticed that this one is ignored. Okay, this one ignore because it is a constant. It has no uncertainties. Okay. If you see it's a number or some sort of constant, that does not have any uncertainties to it, you can just ignore it. So the four pi square here is ignored because it doesn't have any uncertainty. All right. So you only bother about L and T square giving you this. Now your question already told you the fractional uncertainty of T is X and L is Y. So this one you can easily just write this back as Y. 2x. So 
f of delta g over g is equal to 2x plus 1. They want the fractional uncertainty of g only. Okay, so this is one part. Okay, so this one is fine. Then we move on to the next example. There's only two examples there. So I'll finish off those two examples for you. Okay, for four, a body moves with acceleration A starting from rest, it moves a distance S 10, 10 plus minus 0 0.01 meter for a time of four plus minus 0 0.1 second. Given that S is equal to half AT squared, calculate the acceleration and state the result as two different forms. A plus minus absolute uncertainty, A plus minus the percentage uncertainty. So the thing that you can do is this. S is half A T squared. You make A the subject because that's what you want. A is 2S divided by T squared. So therefore, delta A over A equals to delta s over s plus 2 delta t over t. So again, the 2 here is ignored. If it's a number, if it's a constant, there's no uncertainty. Just ignore that. So you only bother about this. All right, so once you have this, you can actually start calculating. A is equals to 2 times 10 divided by 4 square, 20 divided by 16, you will get 1.25 meter per second square. So now you need to find out in terms of absolute uncertainty and percentage uncertainty. Now this one you can say delta A over 1.25 equals to 0 0.01 divided by 10.00 plus with 2 times of 0 0.1 over 0.0. So delta A Wait, uh, there's actually a easier way to do this. Maybe you just leave it as A first in fractional form first because yeah this one would help you to simplify a method further uh you just find the fractional uncertainty first this one is just 0 0.01 divided by 10.00 plus with 2 0 0.1 divided by 4.0 0 0.01 divided by 10 0 0.2 divided by 4 plus 0.2 Wait, 0 0.01 divided by 10 plus with 0 0.2 divided by 4. You should be getting 0 0.051. Okay, so therefore, percentage uncertainty of A is just going to be 0 0.051 times 100, giving you 5.1%. Okay, this is you finding the percentage uncertainty. Now, from delta A equals Delta A over A equals to 0 0.051. You can actually start to sub in your value of A, 1.25 equals to 0 0.051. So delta A is 0 0.051 times 1.25. It will be 0 0.06. I leave it in one as a. Okay. I leave it in. 1SF, then 2DP. One SF, 2DP. Okay, so now what I want to do now is to express them in this form. So therefore, A is 1.25 plus minus 0 0.06 meter per second squared. 
a is 1.25 plus minus 5.1 percent meter per second squared. This is you expressing it in the required form. Okay.